they practicing occultist or a magician or a witch or whatever you want to call them should they only be focusing on the stuff that is designed to like elevate the spirit and purify the soul and move us closer to some sort of like godly revelation or should they be using you know the influences of energy and spirits and stars to change the world around them uh and i think it's a combination of both welcome to the cosmic keys podcast this is going to be your episode for april 1st 2019 all the way to april 7th 2019 and we have a really fun interview for you guys today with eric arneson of my alchemical bromance podcast it's a really fun discussion where we go over things like Freemasonry and what the occult scene is like in Portland. So definitely stay tuned for that. But before we get into the interview, let's do our forecast for this week. And I think um, we got the moon card last week, right? We did, yeah. So did you have any like deep-seated demons come through? Um. Okay, well, I was thinking about that. Like... <clears throat> I guess during Mercury retrograde, I try to make um, a point to revisit my journals from the past because I'm a journaler. Mm -hmm. Like I literally have like a Gmail account where I've been keeping track of my life for years and I'm just trying to keep track, trying to put my whole past few years into perspective and I was rereading that stuff this week and sort of realizing how far I've come in a way. So first of all, it was making me realize like how I used to worry way more about life and about what people thought of me and what I should be doing and what hoops I should be jumping through. And it, I don't know, it just put everything into perspective and it's like the whole, uh, I guess like I've been thinking a lot about the law of attraction because I am it today in a pretty good, happy time in my life, especially in comparison to reading my old journals and stuff. And now it's like I need to just like focus on the good to draw in more good and not have negative thoughts. So like realizing what negative thoughts are made me think of the moon card and also like kind of out of the blue, I, um, did, I had somebody reach out to me, um, to do an astrology reading over Skype. And I have, I sort of do that and I'm trying to do it more, but, um, that was really powerful. Like I, I did the reading, maybe the person I did it for is listening, but, um, we went deep and stuff and I was like, okay, yeah, I do serve this role as an astrologer. And it kind of made me realize, you know, my own role as sort of like a in the healing arts, I guess, and sort of being like sort of an esoteric garage shrink for certain people, you know. So that made me think of the moon card. And I also had some crazy like lucid dreaming astral projection crap happens <laughs> right when Mercury was near Neptune. Yeah. So, but no like major like dark spooky moon card drama it was a pretty good week in general but how about you yeah yeah i think the same i didn't have any like crazy drama going on i definitely had some weird ass dreams yeah. um but i tend to get a lot of like weird lucid dreams so it's not too out of the ordinary um and yeah the moon card it's not just kind of about like this shadow side coming through it i like what you said like kind of doing that astrology reading kind of like finding like okay i'm accepting that this is this role that i'm doing because the moon card has got that like crooked road like not everyone can walk that road you know and the moon card in a way is it's the moon so it's in part tied to the high priestess which is all about being brave enough to just kind of decide you know I'm going to walk that edge of the unknown, of sane and insane, and just kind of keep going down that path and see where it leads. So I kind of feel like we're both on that, you know, crooked path in a way. Yeah. And even just doing the reading, I mean, you know, I I take astrology very seriously. It's a huge part of my life. It's why we have this show. 
But even when we're doing this forecast, you know, we're putting it out there and there aren't necessarily like spooky, like goosebumps moments of just doing a forecast every week. But doing that reading, it's like, oh, shit, this is actually not just like my studious intellectual pursuit. There is actually like a supernatural, unexplainable component just with the way that their chart was matching what I was saying and the things were revealing themselves throughout. And it just gave me the sense like, yeah, this is not no joke. You know, it's, it's deep. It's the moon. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Well, are we uh, ready to see what our, our card for this upcoming week is? We are. Let's see what okay. let's see what you got. I'm going to give it a couple more shuffles. And I'm actually going to be flying to Japan on Thursday. So the only card I don't want to see is the tower card. Because lately I've been a little bit freaked out with airplanes because that plane went down. Did you remember hearing about that a couple weeks ago? I think it was in like Africa, maybe Ethiopia, where they grounded all of the same type of planes that were made by Boeing because they had some like malfunction. I did hear some Mercury retrograde stuff about like some planes in Europe, like literally just going to the wrong airport somehow. Yeah, there's just been some weird stuff going on with planes and I used to not like be as worried, but now I'm like starting to get a little more worried, but we'll see what we have coming up. If it's your time, it's your time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah i'm just kind of you're more likely to get in a car accident than a plane crash yeah. and i drive all day so <laughs> that's very true yeah okay are we ready yeah let's see knight of pentacles makes another appearance wow he's coming back into our lives like mr chariot did a couple times yeah knight of pentacles it's all about being practical man And I need this card right now because my life is a little bit of a mess. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Just kind of practically, it's been, things have been really busy, like, oddly. Like, I've been getting, like, a lot more stuff coming in, like, readings and stuff like that for my business. And at the same time, I've been really overwhelmed with just kind of, like, how do I answer all the messages each day and, like, Um, answer people's questions and kind of fit that all into my schedule while at the same time like creating content and all this kind of other stuff so I think the knight of pentacles is here at least for me to show me like I need to slow down man it's okay if I can't get to everything every day you know yeah um and I'm still kind of putting the seeds in the ground waiting for things to grow and, and they are growing but with the horse kind of being stopped still, it's like you got to take your time and let things settle, let things grow at their own pace. Well, yeah. So we got this two weeks ago. And yeah. I remember when we got that card two weeks ago, I just met some clients for my real estate job. And I was like, oh, damn, all of a sudden I'm really a real estate agent again and like really doing it. And you know, could possibly make some money, you know, because you, when you're in sales, you never really know. And it, that card that week made me realize sort of um, my, the stability that my day job offers me because I do have a day job. I'm not a full time astrologer or podcaster or artist. So, and since that week, my attitude has been getting, you know, more and more positive. Like, I don't hate my day job. Like, I used to have situations where, like, oh, I hate my day job. I just can't wait to, like, get done with work and do what I'm passionate about. But now I'm like, thank God I have this day job because, like, now the stress and worry of being, like, a starving artist is just kind of gone. And those clients that I started working with, even back then, I was a little bit hesitant, like, don't get your hopes up. It's not a sealed deal. But in the time since from then to now, um, we have been working more and it, it, it is looking more optimistic. So I think for our listeners, whatever this card meant for you two weeks ago, this might have sort of a, a new um, meaning this week or a continuation of it this week. And you think about it, we had the moon in between. And I really thought of the moon as like, what are your negative emotions and thoughts that are drawing negativity towards Mm -hmm. you in regard to money and stability? And how can you manage those and sort of use the law of attraction to like draw in the good and 
and keep the bad thoughts at bay. So yeah, maybe just like take what you've learned from the moon card last week and don't let those like psychic self sabotages happen in the topic of money and stability, I guess. Yeah, I think it's also kind of like being cool with where you're at, you know, too, at the same time. Like, you're not the king of pentacles at this time. You're not the top of your game yet. But the knight of pentacles shows that you made that plan. You set yourself on this path. And you just got to keep steady. It's all about kind of the steady day-to-day routine. Even if it feels a little bit boring sometimes, you're headed in the right direction. And that day in and day out consistent work is what's going to get you there. Well, it's interesting too, because, you know, now that I'm, as we get into the astrology forecast for the week ahead, last week was when Mercury went direct and it's technically the end of this Mercury retrograde in Pisces month Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> with all the Pisces stuff that happened. But, you know, it is, it, it, We said that last week wasn't the end. It's not over yet. And when I look at this week, this is sort of when it really does end. And when you really can shift out of that watery moon card Pisces energy into this stable Knight of Pentacles Earth energy. Um, So when I look at the forecast... Um, starting on the first, um, you know, the moon is going to, the moon will be in Pisces at the start of the week. And, um, so it's going to be, it's going to start off sort of moon card, you know, like picking up, um, that watery energy in the beginning and be careful because it's April fool's day. So (laughs) be suspicious. (laughs) And as, so Mercury went direct last Thursday, um, And as Mercury starts moving forward again to move its way out of the sign of Pisces, this week it's going to be getting closer and closer to Neptune. And on Tuesday, April 2nd, Mercury makes a conjunction with Neptune. So I think this conjunction with Neptune might make the Mercury retrograde stuff extend into the very beginning of the week. And Tuesday, you might be like, I thought Mercury retrograde is over. Why am I having these crazy malfunctions and stuff? Um, when Mercury makes that connection with Neptune on Tuesday, that's sort of a big hurdle that will get past. And then from Tuesday moving forward, the retrograde crap will really start to fade. And you'll really get a sense of your mind moving in a forward direction away from the confusion and stuff. And also, you know, like, when we were talking about the moon card and stuff, when Mercury made this conjunction with Neptune last week, I had like crazy lucid dreams, astral projection type experiences. So this might be something to look forward to. Like on Tuesday, uh, if you have a dream journal, like, and also the, so the moon is going to be connecting with, um, with Mercury and, with Neptune. So Moon, Mercury, and Neptune are all going to be kind of connecting on Tuesday in Pisces. So that's like super psychic and super lucid dream friendly. So honestly, like pull out the crystal ball, pull out the dream (laughs) journal, pull out the tarot cards, pull out the whatever, like mushrooms, weed, whatever. I mean, I'm saying mushrooms because Rune Soup just had an episode on like t- taking shrooms. <laughs> That's just me thinking out loud. But yeah, you know, Tuesday is a great psychic and sort of mystical day with the moon, Mercury, and Neptune all coming together. Then as we look ahead, um, as the week goes further, this is building towards Friday, which is going to be the new moon in Aries. So Friday... Um, It's going to be really early in the morning, 4.50 a.m. Eastern time. Um, We get our new moon in Aries. So, like, I think of this as a strong new moon because we're out of this Mercury retrograde thing. And when you think of the new moon as a new beginning, this is a new beginning in the fire sign of Aries, like spring forward, 
spring energy. So I'm so happy to start feeling that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and I, I think it's we're honestly I sort of dread this time of the year with like spring in Chicago. It can be really bad. We are getting some blue skies. We are mm-hmm. getting warm weather, and I'm just like. I feel that Aries excitement, you know, almost like the in Aries is known for being really impatient too. Like you want to start moving forward, but the month of April actually is sort of like highly contrasted from the month of March. And there's just a lot to start, sort of start looking forward to in April. And this Friday, um, April 5th, I think that's going to be like really a good starting point for starting something fresh. Um, Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, really, um, the the only other aspect that's happening will be on Saturday, April 7th. Mercury is going to sextile Saturn. Sunday, you mean? Did I say Saturday? Yeah. Sunday, April 7th, Mercury is going to sextile Saturn. So this is an aspect that we already experienced a couple weeks ago because, you know, when Mercury moves backwards and forwards again, he hits these planets twice. So sextiling to Saturn um, is sort of just yet another indicator of like fixing whatever got screwed up by the retrograde or, or bringing clarity to whatever was confusing about the retrograde motion. So like... When Mercury in Pisces sextiles Saturn and Capricorn, um, it, that'll give you a nice moment of clarity for the week ahead so your thoughts are more um, clear and focused and sort of organized as opposed to just like confused and flooded or extra psychic like they were earlier in the week. Um But yeah, that's pretty much it for the astrology of the week. Not a ton of action happening um yeah there's gonna be like the month of april will still be busy and you know now that mercury retrograde is over you it is a time to reflect on like what you actually learned from the confusion or from the month of march so i think it's good to like now that we're in april just think what happened in march was it totally awful um was it totally bad and like think about where you are now and think about where you're moving forward towards and the knight of pentacles being our car of the week you know i think there is like a a patience element to it because Mm -hmm. mercury wrapping up this retrograde stuff in pisces it makes sense that we have like an earth card to sort of have a really practical thing to have this great new beginning on Friday with the new moon in Aries. And then the month of April with all the fun stuff that's happening in April and on into the spring. Um, It's a good week to plan ahead and sort of prepare. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it brings good balance for sure. Yeah. And even just thinking, you know, like um, Mercury goes retrograde a lot it happens for three weeks a year um three times a year so we're done with this one the next one is going to be happening in july and this is looking pretty far ahead but july is going to be kind of a gnarly month um so i guess yeah my advice is just think about like what came up in the month of march and how can you use the knight of pentacles to be practical about the month of April because you have to be strategic with with Mm -hmm. forecasting your weeks on a weekly and monthly basis like if you know you're going to be in the clear for a while you need to take advantage of it before stuff goes haywire once again so yeah yeah definitely well I think uh, it's going to be a good week then coming up lots of fun things to look forward to and um I'll be uh, gone next week, so (laughs) I'm heading to Japan for a while, so that'll be fun. And I'm just glad I did not get that tower card. (laughs) Yeah, well, you you should definitely, I mean, how can you be earthy in Japan? There's probably a lot of great Oh, the cherry blossoms are blooming right now. So just kind of like the literal earth element, I think, is going to be very present. Um, I think of like a Zen garden. Well, I'm going to a friend's Shinto wedding, so like oh, at a Shinto temple, yeah. So it's gonna be very like earthy. I'm really excited to 
see what a traditional Shinto wedding ceremony is going to be like um, and connecting with that kind of energy. And and I'm going to visit a ton of other temples there, so I'm sure I'll have some good stories when I get back. Yeah, it's better than having like an overactive like fire card or something or like a nasty like swords card, you know. If you have an earth card at a wedding, you know, you can just be like sort of like solid and stable and Oh yeah. The, the Knight of out. Pentacles is who you want to marry. This is someone who's yes, stable, yeah. got a good job, you know, isn't gonna run off and do some crazy stuff. So yeah. Knight of Pentacles is like the ideal husband. Maybe not the ideal date, but <laughs> yeah. the ideal life partner. Um, yeah, and it probably it might be a sign that you know you won't have to deal with like financial stress while you're there because that can. That's true too. I probably won't like lose my wallet or anything. Yeah, I sometimes. Well, I'm a bad example, <laughs> but sometimes I go on vacation and then spend too much on my credit card, and then when it's over, I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah. So we are gonna jump into our interview section now. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, and hearing from Eric from My Alchemical Bromance. All right, guys. So today we are super excited. We have Eric Arneson on our show. Eric is the host of a really great podcast called My Alchemical Bromance, which is a great title, first of all. Um, His show, it gets really deep into a lot of like really interesting, specific topics related to the occult. I think of, you know, you've talked about the picatrix you talk about really scholarly stuff and i love hearing all of these sort of in-depth conversations and my alchemical bromance is fun too like often they're drinking beers talking about beers and it's casual conversations but you know if you hear our show and you want to get really deep a little bit deeper maybe i think my alchemical bromance offers that but welcome to cosmic keys to eric how you doing today eric I'm doing pretty good. It's a lovely Friday. Awesome. So yeah, we are super excited to have you on our show today. And we've been really enjoying listening to your episodes. And it seems like you guys cover quite a few different topics within kind of the various occult community and and esoteric ideas and things like that. Um, So I'd like to know just to start off, what's the origin story of your podcast? Like, why did you decide to start My Alchemical Bromance? Uh, I got tricked into starting my alchemical bromance. I wasn't I wasn't intending to start a podcast, um, but one of my so I mean I'm 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 sort of a I'm s- sort of a co-host even though I'm the only host that really shows up most of the time. But one of the other guys, Matt, um, he had a podcast on Freemasonry, and um, we were having some we were just having like this weekend where a a few of us were hanging out drinking beer telling weird stories and i was telling weird stories and and i have a lot of weird stories in my past but uh he he was laughing and laughing and laughing he's like eric this is great we should do a podcast i said okay and i thought he was talking about doing a podcast episode and i thought he wanted to interview me about freemasonry for his Masonic podcast, but then before I knew it, he had like the name picked out, and he was like, "Here's the format. Here's what we're gonna do. Here's how we're gonna record it." And I'm like, "This is a lot of work for one episode." He said, "This isn't an episode. This is a whole podcast." <laughs> uh, and then he uh, left me to run it. <laughs> so that's the really short version. Um, and originally, it was just gonna be the three of us, Matt and Joey and I, and we were just gonna every episode was gonna be the three of us sitting around drinking beer we were either going to visit breweries or or have like a tasting at one of our houses uh and we would pick some occult topic and we would talk about it and um record it but uh they have real lives and ran out of free time whereas i am a really slacker oriented freelancer and have tons of free time (laughs) I'm kind of um, similar. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great way to live. It's a great way to live. Yeah. I mean, unless you have to pay bills. Um, so I just started doing it on my own. And one of the things I started doing was reaching out to people that I knew in the occult community or in the Masonic community uh, to interview them. 
Um, I was going to try to do mostly local people because Portland is filled with weirdos. But it soon became pretty obvious that I didn't want to just keep to local people. So I started reaching out. Uh, and I've had some really surprising and really fascinating guests. You know, you're talking about some of the interesting deep topics we get into. Sometimes it's stuff that I'm uh, really interested in. Sometimes I'm kind of clueless on it. Sometimes I end up interviewing people who are so much more intelligent than I could ever hope to be, which I think that's kind of what you want to do on a podcast. I'm not sure. Uh, but it's been pretty fascinating. Like, yeah, I, that's... Did I answer the question? That was I, I started to ramble there a little bit. No, you definitely <laughs> answered the question. That was that was great. So yeah, I, I have the vibe too. I've never been to Portland, but that there's some some weird, unique individuals there. Is there kind of like a cool occult community there? Would you say, or or what's the the vibe like? I really don't want to make you guys too jealous. So, <laughs> so try not to. You know. So basically, Portland doesn't have. Uh, a cool occult community it has like dozens of them oh wow it's bizarre i i and i've been trying to explore and kind of connect with them but it's totally you know there are there are secret groups there are public groups there are wiccans there's a golden dawn organization allegedly there's uh there are lodges of freemasons that are filled with esoteric stuff there are um there are clandestine Masonic organizations. There are informal groups. There's a group of friggin' chaos magician artists that's just like blocks away from here that do crazy stuff. Uh, there are there are like four different occult themed podcasts out of Portland that at least at least maybe there are more. Oh shit, there are more. I'm just I just remembered there's a there's a Wiccan podcast that just started like there's they're all over the place. There's Covens. It's tons. Tons and tons of people in Portland are into this stuff. We have I mean we're a we're a a, a fairly small city like Portland inside Portland city limits has fewer than a million people and yet I think we have probably like six different occult shops. In fact, sometimes I'll find out about occult shops that have like been there for years that I just had never noticed. So there are probably more than six. Wow. Yeah, we like on this show we always kind of like to hear what people's you know local culture, how it affects them and everything. So you're from Oregon originally, right? Yes. Yeah, I've I've been here my entire life. So like I, when I think of Portland, I think of it like. Denver or Austin or Nashville, you know, there it seems like a small city that in the past 10 or so years has really got, I don't gotten want to trendy. say, gotten <laughs> trendy and stuff like that. So like what, since you're from there and you've seen it and you've been around for a while, like what are your reflections on the way that Portland's changed over the years? And is there any crossover in the way like the occult communities have changed? Oh, that's a good question. So I've only lived in Portland um, since 2011. And <clears throat> um, Portland is going through a huge population boom right now. So lots of people have been moving here. Uh, there's been tons and tons of construction. Um, and the people who are moving here tend to be, you know, I don't get the impression that the people moving here are weird people. It's mm -hmm. sort of like, waves of people following jobs and business and stuff and they tend to not be super interesting and that's not a very nice thing to say i let's not say no that's what i was expecting way. you to say that's what i was sort of yeah. getting so at. I would <laughs> say they might be watering it down but they all at the same time maybe not you know i mean a lot of the um a lot of the people in sort of my closest occult circles closest circles of occultists um are fairly new to the city so it could be that people are moving here because it's welcoming to that sort of stuff. That's one of the things that I really loved about moving to Portland because I lived in southern Oregon, which is fairly rural. And it's hard to be um, unusual. It's hard to be a weird person or an unusual person in, in a rural area because uh, rural Americans are not very tolerant. Sure. And, 
and especially communities can can have like a you know cities and stuff tend to be fairly conservative and not very open to people being different or unusual so i and and it can hurt things like business opportunities and income and jobs and social life and it it can you know affect everything so it was interesting moving to portland and being in a city where nobody really cared where like i could be like you know i'm a wizard and nobody would care they'd be like oh yeah well that dude's a furry and that dude's possessed by a demon and you know everybody else has mohawks so that's cool <laughs> yeah. <a> wizard. <laughs> that's awesome i think you just convinced me that i should move to portland <laughs> I, feel, I... I feel like it sounds like a really good time yeah, uh, uh, right now I think our our rents are decreasing because they they overbuilt. So yeah, it's totally a good time. Mm, yeah, <laughs> it's surprising how small the occult community is here in Chicago. Like I don't know how many people we have, but like three million, something like that. Yeah. And Chicago's huge. I think yeah. it's bigger than three. Yeah, it might even be bigger I, than I could not, I'm so bad at numbers with like numbers like that. I have no idea. But we just have like two occult shops and there's like a couple different communities like here and there. But I feel like I run into the same people, like the same 10 people are going to all of the events. So I feel like there it's, it doesn't really have much going on, you know, with the scene as you would expect for such a large city. Yeah, um, I guess uh, that's disappointing. <laughs> well, I mean, we don't know for sure. Like, I feel like there are a lot of people that we just have not met, or maybe we have, like, Scarlett and I s- started hanging out, and we were just on the same page. We could talk mm-hmm. about, you know, tarot, astrology, um, anything esoteric, anything new agey, and, it, you know, we're could share podcasts and videos and authors that we like and stuff. There are a few groups and I'm not, I, and I really have met cool people at those yeah. groups. Mm-hmm. There's just something, <laughs> there's like a little bit of social um, challenges with some of the people that I've encountered in this Chicago scene. It's like, and I, I don't re- really want to like be judgmental, but I feel like I'm just not on the same page. Like there, there's, there's a cool, there's a fun way to be weird and different. And then there's just sort of like, I feel slightly just, creepy way. There's a slightly like there's social cues are a little off and it's like, are you, <laughs> are you like into this stuff because you're sort of like working through some sort of mental health or like challenges? Like, I don't know. I, I feel like both of us are good muggles on the surface but a lot of the occult people we meet are maybe like that person is definitely like at the wicca gathering you know what i mean (laughs) yeah yeah like you could look at both of us and have no idea yeah that we were into all this crazy shit until you looked us up online Mm -hmm. but (laughs) (laughs) yeah i guess uh i mean you get a mix in portland you know you there are um yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm now I'm thinking of people that I know, and like, there are some people like uh, uh, Jay Swafford who designed the the Picatrix uh, Deccans deck. That is an awkward name, isn't it? It's a <laughs> deck of cards that is all the Picatrix Deccan images. It's a beautiful deck. Uh, but you look at him and you're sort of like, oh, yeah, that's just an ordinary guy. And then you start talking to him and you're like, oh man, this dude is like a hardcore ceremonial magician, multimedia artist, and. Uh, and then there are other people, you know, like my buddy Nate, who's been on the podcast a few times. You look at him and you're right away sort of thinking that guy has got to be some sort of like terrifying evil magician. And he's not terrifying or evil, but uh, he's, you know, he's way into he's like deep into esoteric Freemasonry and other stuff that he probably doesn't want me mentioning on the Internet. So. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it's a you get a mix, you get a really broad mix. I once met a guy from the OTO. Oh, I know uh, people which... in the OTO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we is a Chicago OTO. A... I've been many times. Yeah. I'm not a member yeah. though. Yeah, there's actually a um, a famous uh, uh, OTO branch in Chicago. I, I'm totally oh, yeah. gonna uh, the Amha Lodge. I'm friends yeah. with the high priestess there. She's and really those cool. Those are the ones that have like the. Uh, the OTO voodoo stuff with like the the time travel spider web techniques and things like that. Well, I haven't gone 
too deep in, into it. So I've just attended uh, like a, the Gnostic Mass from time to time. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't think I'm going to become a member of the OTO, but, you know, I just attend every once in a while because I'm friends with the high priestess. And I mean, it's a cool thing to experience. And for our listeners that might not be familiar, um, the OTO is, it stands for the Order of the Templo Orientis. And um, it was it has a lot to do with Aleister Crowley um, and his ideas. But, you know, I definitely recommend for the listeners who might not be aware, just like look it up and consider going to a Gnostic Mass because it's like a really interesting ritual to experience and to be part of. Um, definitely not for everyone, but... I'm working through what I'm comfortable with and what I like and everything. And I'm pretty damn open-minded but in general i just sort of have an aversion to crowley for now so i i have i haven't been and i don't know much about it i uh i don't necessarily have an aversion to crowley but i do um i'm not a th- i'm not really into the religion behind the oto so mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. not really for me but um but yeah, yeah, the, the, there's a really active OTO chapter here. Um, I know that there's actually a, a really good OTO chapter in Minneapolis. I've got some, I've got uh, a friend who's a, who has been attending some of their events, and it sounds really cool. And I think they've got guys like Rufus Opus and. Um, oh, I Does he remember. live in Minneapolis? I don't know if he lives in Minneapolis, but I think he goes to the OTO meetings there. I've read. I have his. Um... Whatever that book is, the uh, Seven Spheres. The Seven Spheres is an excellent system. Yeah. I I, I really, I mean, I didn't like see any archangels, but I didn't try very hard. But it was really cool to just like, (laughs) you know, read through it and get the sense of like, I, astrology is my like bedrock, you know, and Mm -hmm. that's like very planetary. So, you know, that was immediately um interesting to me but i've not had any um real tangible experiences work out you know the way he described it in the book at least yeah uh my only advice to you there would be that sometimes you need to let go of your uh expectations for what real is yeah Mm mm-hmm interesting yeah. after and, that it gets kind of weird yeah so you mentioned freemason and is is one of your co-hosts a freemason or are you also a freemason um all three of us are freemasons oh. that's actually how we met uh nate also the he who shows up sometimes is a freemason um we've also had uh some uh, co-masons um on our podcast every once in a while uh so yeah we're pretty freemasonry is a pretty big part of now, so Freemasonry is not going to be as steeped in occult stuff, depending on where you are in the world. But in in Oregon and Portland, um, there are quite a few. There's a pretty big uh, crossover between um, younger members who are Mason, younger Masons and uh, the and occultists. Mm, yeah, because I feel like I've been hearing more and more um, younger people kind of start to get interested in Freemasonry yeah. and I, I was a bit surprised because it did seem to me like something kind of like older people do like it was more kind of like a fraternity type thing but but yeah I think maybe there is some type of resurgence going on yeah I think there is it's not uh, it's not quite enough to make up for the losses that we're having from uh, old people dying but um, but the nice thing is that the young people who are joining have a really good outlook on what Freemasonry should be offering and what it should be doing in the world. And, um, and they're sort of turning it into more of what, um, I was expecting to find when I first joined the fraternity, which is a group of curious philosophical seekers who want to practice, um, uh, you know, the art of virtue. So when, like with you being a member and everything, um, 
what is that what is your like day or i guess week to week month to month experience like you go to the you pay the dues obviously and you do the um initiation and everything did you just kind of like walk in and say hey i want to be a freemason or uh yes i did it was it was about 19 years ago though um in in ashland oregon and i basically just walked into the lodge there and uh i think i i called the lodge is what i did i called it on a landline i don't know if you guys have ever seen those before well we um, have we're like in a, our 30s we're 30, telephone 30, 31. <laughs> <laughs> i was <laughs> sorry um <laughs> no but i i called the lodge and um was invited to come down for like their thursday morning coffee and donuts thing and i walked in and i was the youngest guy there by probably 50 years uh, maybe 40 years i don't know it was i was in my 20s at the time um and it was uh like they you know it it again this is a sort of experience it's going to be different from lodge to lodge but in most lodges you have to ask to be a member like they nobody they aren't allowed to recruit you and um and some lodges and it's getting more common now where lodges are being more discreet and more careful about who they who they give petitions to so uh, the lodge i went to they were just so excited that anybody was interested that they gave me a petition right away they didn't even know me um but the lodge that I belong to now, Esoterica Lodge in Portland, uh, we don't let anybody join um, until they've been coming to public events at our lodge for at least six months. Um, and then there are other lodges in Portland who sometimes can be even stricter. So it really has to do with, like, the lodge itself, it really wants to be sort of a cohesive, very trusting uh, group of friends right so when somebody shows up and is like i want to be a mason the lodge should be evaluating them and like is this guy going to fit in uh you know do they have something that they're bringing to the table uh, are they here just for mercenary motives like there's all these things that 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 should be asked and stuff but but yeah it's it's not quite as simple as like walking in and being like hey i want to be a mason usually there's a little bit of a you know they want to get to know you first. So as far as like as much of a commitment in your life, is it like a weekly thing? Is it a monthly thing? Is it a daily thing? Like what do you actually have to do to be a part of it? Because even that is sort of unclear to me. It really depends. Um, I mean, you can just be a very surface level Mason who barely does anything and go through the initiations and then never go back to Lodge. Mm hmm. Um, and beyond that, the level of involvement that you can have uh, is really up to you and your ability to learn how to say no. Like if you show an eagerness to be involved, people will be inviting you to more and more stuff and you'll be invited to take more and more, uh, take on more and more responsibility, more and more ritual roles. Um, but at probably like the, so first of all, the, the during the joining process, going through the first three, de the, the three Blue Lodge degrees, uh, that tends to be a lot of work. There's a lot of memorization that has to be done. Um, and, uh, and there are the three initiations that you have to go through. Um, and then after you do those three initiations and the memory work that goes along with them, after that, probably the minimum investment to sort of be considered like an active useful mason i would guess it's probably like two nights a month and like do you guys what do you guys do like do you guys, <laughs> i mean other than what the goes ritual, on in those buildings uh, well, i know it's again, secret again, that's, but <laughs> that's just from lodge to lodge i can tell you what my lodge does um because i love my lodge i love my lodge and i think that we do incredible stuff so I'll tell you about what two different lodges in, in Portland do. So my lodge is Esoterica Lodge. Our lodge is focused on um, Masonic education and uh, ritual experience. So for ritual, so so we meet pretty much two nights a month. One night is our what's called our stated meeting or our stated communication, which is our ritualized meeting, the where we have a ritual opening. Um, a, a structured uh, agenda and that agenda is going to involve things like uh, 
you know, we have to we have to pay bills and talk about our minutes and talk about sort of the business of running the lodge. But then we spend most of the meeting um, having discussions about Masonic philosophy or listening to people um, give talks about uh, some aspect of Freemasonry and then discussing that. Uh, sometimes we do guided meditations um, and then we have a ritualized closing and then we all go downstairs and we have a drink together and we talk until um, the guy with the keys to the building kicks us out. That sounds fun. If you wanted it for networking purposes, it serves that function too, right? It is crappy for networking purposes. It is? I, I have a, yeah, I mean, I've done a little bit of networking there. I've gotten a few jobs here and there through um, through Freemasonry, you know, as a you know, freelance type things, but uh, it's really not good for job networking. In fact, most of the people in my lodge, if you ask me what they do for a living, I've got no idea. We'd never talk about that. We're instead right. talking about, like, the significance of, you know, the, the, the theological virtues on Jacob's Ladder or you know, the, the astrological symbolism in the lodge, or like we're getting in, we're way off in the weeds somewhere. We're not talking about like, oh yeah, I had a crappy day filling up my TSA reports the, at the mm. office. My, my cubicle walls are a delightful shade of gray. We don't talk about that. Um, so then, okay, so now I'll, I'll compare that to another lodge. Uh, one, another one of my favorite lodges in Portland, Columbia Lodge, um, is very much, I mean, it's an incredible group of people. Uh, and they're all, it's a really tight knit friends group that is sort of the core of that lodge. And, it, and it, it grows, it's been growing a lot recently. And there's probably, uh, there's probably a dozen or so guys who go to that lodge. They meet um, in the evening. They have uh, a dinner together that's really delicious usually. They go have their business meeting and their business meeting consists of the same stuff where they have to pay some bills, they have to take care of minutes. Um, they usually have... Uh, one or more community service events that they're either planning or wrapping up. So they'll talk about those, um, whether they're fundraisers or they do like a di they do like a picnic every year where they sort of host it for other lodges in the area. Uh, and uh, so they take care of that business. Uh, they usually have a very short discussion on Masonic philosophy, and then they close up and they go across the street to the bar and they have some beer and they talk about Freemasonry and tell jokes. Yeah. So as far as I know, um, women aren't allowed to be Freemasons, but there's a separate organization called the Order of the Eastern Star. Is that right? Yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than that. You, you, we probably don't want to spend the whole time talking about this because there are some great resources that could do a more succinct job explaining it than I could. Yeah, the Order of the Eastern Star is part of um, the group, the, the Masonic sort of super group that I'm in which uh, which we usually call um, sometimes it's called regular Freemasonry sometimes it's called conservative Freemasonry but it is in 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 the branch of Freemasonry that I'm part of uh, which is by far the largest branch in the United States by like orders and orders of magnitude um, the Blue Lodge the Masonic Lodge is men only and the Order of the Eastern Star is an appendant body that has men and women in it mm. um but there are other organizations. So, for instance, um, uh, Le Droit Humain um, is a French order of Freemasonry that is fairly active in the United States that, ha that has men and women as members. Um, there are a number of other organizations. Like, you really have to uh, look around and see what's available. But uh, women can be Freemasons, just not in my particular organization. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing because, like, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, I've discovered f what Freemasonry is f via conspiracy theories, and like when I was a kid, I never was, I didn't know what was going on, you know. And I think a lot of people pre YouTube, unless their family was in it or something, they probably would not know what the hell Freemasonry is. And over the years, it's sort of gotten a lot of. Uh, crazy associations with it but i think you're the only real mason that i've had a conversation like this with so it's it's interesting to hear what's actually going on there yeah it's funny um i have uh i have mason friends across the united states but i don't think i know any freemasons in chicago 
Hmm. I know there's a lodge in Evanston that has like <laughs> I was kind of looking into it because I'm on we're on the north side of the city and Evanston is just oh, yeah. right north. Um, they have some kind of like chalice or something. It's like a gold cup with like the zodiac on it, but that's their like sort of I don't want to call it a sacred object, but it's like come visit this lodge and see the gold cup or something. So that's the only thing huh. I know about that lodge. But I think, you know, Evanston, that's where uh, Northwestern University is. And it, it seems like a, it probably is an old school lodge, I'm guessing, because Evanston is an old town. So yeah, I always find it fascinating sometimes when you see these lodges and they're like, if you're driving through kind of more rural America and like you go through a pretty much dead town, there's always like a Masonic lodge still there. Yeah. You know, and it's, and then sometimes I'll be like just going about my day and I'll see like someone with a Masonic ring or like a license plate with the symbol and I'm like, oh, he's a Mason. Yeah. But I don't really know what that means. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, well, this is cool. <laughs> I found you've been the on lodge. our watch list for a long time, Scarlett. So. <laughs> hey, I'd join if I could, but uh, well, who knows? I'm going to look into these, these other kind of offshoots and maybe consider joining and. In part, I feel like it's like I was in a sorority in, in college, so I, I love the whole like ritual aspect of being in a sorority, like the initiation and and the regular meetings and like the sense of community. So I feel like I've been missing that since since college. Well, I'll tell you, there's a few things. So first of all, if you're interested in, in Le Dois um let me know back channel and I'll, I'll get you in touch with some people. Um, but... Uh, so Wicca, for instance, like or like formalized Wicca, like a uh, Gardnerian stuff, is mm-hmm. kind of like the great granddaughter of Freemasonry. Mm-hmm. And there's there's stuff in Wicca that is directly descended from Freemasonry. For instance, the phrase "so mote it be." Yeah, mm-hmm. it's totally Freemasonry. Oh. Uh, the the three degree initiation system, mm-hmm. totally Freemasonry. Um, the uh, and then also like the the whole um, lodge magic style. So uh, the 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 Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and the OTO um, are sort of like the two biggest sort of like lodge magic groups that are still operating in any form in some form. But um, but that style of of doing ceremonial magic and having it be in the form of a lodge opening and closing and these sort of like uh, strict sort of uh, lodge officer roles totally stolen from Freemasonry. Mm. So in a way, Freemasonry has had this huge effect on on sort of the occult community and um, pagan religions as they're being practiced today that um, that Masons, mainstream Freemasonry, really doesn't want people to pay attention to. And uh, and since mainstream Freemasonry is so so old man dorky, uh, I think that a lot of pagans don't want to pay attention to that connection either. So uh, that, that it's a it's an interesting rabbit hole of research to go down, and I would totally encourage you to poke that hornet's nest and see what comes out of it. I mean, yeah. I suppose if it's a hornet's nest, hornets will come out of it. Poke that mysterious unknown nest and hope that it's not full of hornets. <laughs> well, speaking of poking the hornet's nest... It seems like you might own a few grimoires or two or old texts and stuff. And, it, you know, you, you mentioned you like nerding out on like the hardcore occultism. Like, mm-hmm. what have you tried and give us all the, 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 juicy, the details. juicy details? Like, what's like the craziest <laughs> experience you've had, like messing with this stuff? As much as you want to actually tell us, you know. Oh, sure, sure. Um well, it's all been pretty crazy. Uh, I I started uh, sort of down the the crazy occult road when I was fairly young. I got my first tarot deck probably when I think when I was like twelve or thirteen or fourteen or something. Oh, so me too. a zillion years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, it was the Alice in Wonderland tarot. Mm. It was so it's totally it's one of those sort of novelty decks totally based on the Rider Waite Smith but everything's replaced with like rabbits and girls in blue dresses and stuff, <laughs> um, and 
and I started playing with that then. I got like my first books on Wicca. I think I had like some Scott Hen- Cunningham and Raymond Buckland books when I was when I was a kid and I started playing with those sorts of things. Um, and my whole sort of every and from that point on, it was just sort of this cascading collection of fringe spirituality and alternative religions and stuff until I started to get into Kabbalah and ceremonial magic, probably right around maybe a couple years before I became a Freemason. Um, but I never really always knew what I was doing. Um, I ended up through just sheer good fortune becoming good friends with John Michael Greer. You guys heard of him? I totally know that name. He was my neighbor. What for... is what is his for our listeners? What is and me because I'm blanking out. <laughs> what um, is his he's... claim to fame? John Michael Greer has been uh, a very prolific and well known um, occult author for years. He's uh, he's the arch druid of the ancient order of druids in America. He. Uh, He's like a grandmaster of tarot. I don't know if they do that grandmaster program anymore, but he's been around for ages and he's been publishing stuff for a long, long time. He does a lot of podcasts, right? I've heard him on a few podcasts. He's been on a culture a few times. And uh, yeah. if, he, if it's the guy I'm thinking of, I think his, he's really interesting to listen to. I'm pretty sure that's I'm thinking of the right he guy. Is. He is fascinating to listen to and fascinating to talk to. Um, and in he moved to Ashland probably in like 2003, 2004, and he joined my Masonic Lodge. Uh, and we just became really good friends. And it turns out we were living like a block away from each other. So we used to go to, over to each other's houses all the time. I'd like go over to his house and he'd be telling me all this crazy stuff and I'd be like taking notes like crazy. Uh, and he kind of got me into... Um, renaissance magic like he really got me started to start looking at that and i uh at the time i think probably the only thing i had that could be considered a grimoire was um the you know the giant black paperback uh three books of occult philosophy right you guys both totally have this book yeah tell me you have this book i've only looked at the pdf so for all intents and purposes no (laughs) all right you guys have to go buy it uh this weekend (laughs) <laughs> um this book is sort of the cornerstone of everything that we really do in uh in in western style magic these days like you'll find everything in there all of like including all of the witchcraft stuff you know like all of the herbs and how they tie to the planets and all everything everything is in there the astrological stuff alone is is worth the contents so he really got me started on sort of using agrippa and combining it with some golden dawn techniques and doing stuff like that and i've had i mean over that many years, there have been boring times with uh, with magic, and then there's been like the crazy stuff where you're sort of like, "How the hell did that even work?" Yeah. Right? Um, and I don't necessarily want to give a lot of it away, but I have, for instance, um, when I was first really starting out with stuff, I was doing this like tarot contemplation where you you know every day you'd pull one card and it'd be like a con- contemplative focus, and you'd you know, meditated on in the morning and in the evening you'd come back to it and be like, how did this card, you know, relate to my day, blah, 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 blah. And I remember at this, at, I was going through a really, really rough patch. My marriage was falling apart. My life was like this huge pile of stress and nothing felt right, uh, which I think probably happens to every occultist at some point or another. You know, you have to, you have to go along the fool's journey and some, at some point you're going to hit the tower. Uh, mm-hmm. God, there's a been a few towers on my path. <laughs> yeah, well, this is probably uh, yeah, me too. But this was a, this was a big tower for me, and um, and I just remember like sort of sitting there one day, you know, bef- I, I had I had finished all of my opening rituals and I was getting ready to do the tarot contemplation, and I just saw in my head the ten of swords which is a card that nobody really wants to see in their head or anywhere, right? You don't want, you don't want mm-hmm. the Ten of Swords anywhere. Near. And then I drew a card and it was the Ten of Swords. And the, it was just so, like, the image of the of the drawing was so perfect before I drew it that I was like, holy shit, I saw the future. Um, yeah. And then I think that was a totally shitty day, too. Just 
<laughs> just to round it all out. Um, so, you know, sometimes there are things like that where there are these moments of like serendipitous stuff where like time doesn't seem to work right or or you seem to see things that aren't there or, or stuff just sort of happens. And then other times you just end up in weird situations with interesting people doing bizarre whatevers. Uh, a great example of that is, uh, I don't know if you listened to my Halloween episode from 2018. Probably. Where, yeah, I'm not um, sure. I got, to, I got together with uh, Alex Bullen from the Alex cast and we summoned a cartoon demon in the middle of a park in the middle of Portland. <laughs> that sounds really, it's ringing a bell for sure. Well, we didn't see a demon, but uh, but it it was a sort of idea. Like we probably came up with it while we were drinking, and then we decided to follow through on it when we weren't. And uh, it was fun. It was weird. Yeah. So, uh, but also, you know, I mean, through it, you know, there's an old, old, old argument between. Um, like differing schools of of uh, Neoplatonism in in late antiquity, whether whether philosophers should be theurgists or thaumaturgists, whether um, and it sort of continues now. Like you have like magic as this sort of path of like spiritual development, but you also have like you know here's a, a spell to win the lottery, or you know make somebody fall in love with you, or you know make a cat explode or whatever um and so it's this question of like is it okay should a should a should a practicing occultist or a magician or a witch or whatever you want to call them should they only be focusing on the stuff that is designed to like elevate the spirit and purify the soul and move us closer to some sort of like godly revelation or should they be using you know the influences of energy and spirits and stars to change the world around them uh and i think it's a combination of both but i would say that the more rewarding part is the the theurgy you know the the working on like improving the self and understanding how the self works and that sort of stuff so the most amazing revelations i've had the most amazing magical operations i've done have been things that have been towards that end which means there hasn't been very much flashy shit, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so so I've been studying astrology, actually, for the last couple of years, but I haven't really been looking at the natal stuff. I've only been doing it as sort of electional astrology for talismans. Yeah, like electional astrology is really interesting, too, because it gets you thinking about the angles between, you know, like the four, um, the first fourth seventh and tenth house that angle is very significant when you're choosing an election and yeah i mean (laughs) it's a deep deep rabbit hole but um yeah that that is a really good way to learn though yeah it's been pretty fascinating um it's uh you know i've mostly been using the picatrix for that and uh and and agrippa so Mainly what I do, mainly what I have done anyhow, is sort of made like checklists. Like here are the good things to look for. Here are the bad things to watch out for and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I do a little bit of that too. Like not necessarily to make talismans, but um, I've even used elections to post the podcast. Like instead of doing it just whenever, it's like I'll do it when... This is the uh, this is the rising sign, and this planet is in this house or whatever. So, mm-hmm. there's little yeah, things use, you can uh, do to just like initiate to like s- hit send on that email at a certain election to submit put something in the mailbox at a certain election. So yeah, that's you true. should that's briefly explain for our listeners what election astrology is, just because yeah, some people might might not be aware of it. electional astrology is basically when um, it's if, not about voting for the president. <laughs> for for Eric, he was talking about making talismans. So, you know, you can make a magical object that would be like imbued with the powers of the planets or the signs at a certain time. So the ascendant is the, the um, sign that is 
in basically at the point of the eastern horizon, you know, everything is moving across, you know, it, it's like a big wheel basically that's constantly turning throughout the day as the earth spins. So the ascendant changes signs every like two or so hours, but depending on the time of the day. But you're basically setting up a chart to elect the initiation of a thing. So if you're making a magical object, you are choosing the time so that the object has these powers at these times. But if you're using it the way I use it, it's like I want a strong mercury thing. Like I'm sending an email blast, for example. Mm -hmm. I would do I would wait for the ascendant to reach a certain point at a certain day so that when I hit send, I'm ca the chart that I would cast for that moment would be laid out in a strategic way, I guess. So it's mm -hmm. electional astrology is basically timing stuff so that the stars happen perfectly. And when you're an astrologer, you, you know what are strong placements and weak placements and like so if i was trying to do a mercury election i would wait for mercury to not be retrograde you know <laughs> um but like jupiter right now is in sagittarius which is its home sign so now is a really good time for doing jupiter stuff and you would time it so that jupiter was maybe in the first house or the 10th house not being harmed by any other outside influences so this is it's more like it's yeah. been tough to find that too jupiter's been getting hammered on a lot by uh wait didn't you think, like dan i think dan got a lottery ticket and he won when like jupiter was was something was that right that was not quite <laughs> electional astrology that was um more because um the new moon in pisces was in my fifth house and i bought the lotto ticket close to the um new moon and the fifth house is the house of pleasure um sort of like just good stuff and I, I i hadn't even heard that the fifth house was a good time to buy a new moon in the fifth house was a good time to buy the lottery ticket but i just did and i won 50 bucks but the mercury retrograde fucked that up and i scraped off the barcode and yesterday i had to go to the goddamn Illinois lottery DMV basically, which was like <laughs> hell on earth. Let me tell you, it so took me like an hour. Was it worth the 50 bucks? No. And my parking was like almost 20 bucks. Cause it was like in the government center downtown with all of the, we're talking about, you know, like <laughs> demonic vibes, go to your local government don't center. You, <laughs> don't you uh, live in, if you live near Evanston, why don't you just take the, the L? Well, I'm a, I'm like an Uber and Lyft driver, and, oh. and the the office is like in the heart of downtown, and I was just like, hey, I'll swing. And I was also contesting a parking ticket, which I couldn't do yesterday. So like yesterday afternoon was sort of like I was in like Dante's seventh layer of hell in the Chicago like downtown government centers. But um, yeah, I got fifty bucks minus the eighteen bucks to park, so I got freaking 32 bucks yay after an hour of like torture <laughs> so yeah there's there's some mercury retrograde for you yeah absolutely well if i were you i would take the 32 bucks and i would go to like three floyds or something and have a really really good beer oh yeah that sounds good yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> well yeah we um we kind of went on a big tangent here but um Oh, yeah. Okay, let's get back to your list. You must have, like, other specific questions for me. Or what the heck was I talking about? Well, we were talking about, like, grimoires and oh, you were yeah. talking about kind of your experiences. Um, but I think we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon. Did you have anything specifically that you wanted to share? Anything you've been working on lately? Um. Let's see. Well, I mean... You know, I, I know that you guys know me through my podcast, but I also have a website, Arnamancy, that I've been running for a long time where I write a lot about like hermetic philosophy and tarot and other occult stuff. So um, uh, and that's been going pretty strong. Uh, I don't know what happened recently, but I think I might have done some 
So you know, I'm 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 kind of a computer nerd, so I pay attention to like website stats and where visitors come from and all that kind of stuff. And somewhere in the last month, I don't know what the heck I did right. I did something, and my traffic increased dramatically. It's very exciting. So uh, I guess that means I have to write more blog posts. So anybody who's listening to this should probably go to the Arnamancy website and see if there's a new blog post. Nice, yeah. Because it'll probably be really good. Well, yeah, like we we follow your like you're on Twitter and Instagram. You you put a lot of stuff on your Arnamancy like social media pages too, which are fun. It seems like you have like a lot of cool images and texts that seem more Renaissance and like old school, which is a really cool imagery to work with. Yeah, I work a lot with um, with Renaissance um, uh, magic and Renaissance techniques. Uh, so, like, I'm really big on um, image magic, you know. So, uh, in fact, I, I was going to interrupt you when you were talking about election astrology because one of the things that's kind of hidden in a lot of the texts is that it's not objects necessarily that receive, like, the stellar influences of uh, astrological talismans. It's images, and sometimes we use the object to keep the image, but you'll see this stated more explicitly in some of the later stuff. The image happens in the soul. So the imagination which creates the image is is the actual receptor of the, the influences, and you're just sort of keeping it in an object, but you can also keep it inside you. Interesting. Yeah, the Picatrix, right? There's a lot of really specific images there mm -hmm. right with all the deckhands and stuff that's stuff that i really want to learn um i just need to get me a copy of, of the picatrix i guess oh yeah there's uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there but also um uh, giordano bruno talks about it uh and you kind of get hints of it even way far back like if you look at some of the um the images and drawings and stuff in like the greek magical papyri those guys were awful artists like truly awful artists <laughs> and you can't imagine that they were like making these horrible sketches on on things and being like look look it's a magic image and people are looking at it and be like oh is that a stick figure horse you know so uh so there's definitely like something else going on there with the way images work uh we probably don't have a whole lot of time to get into it right now but it's definitely a really interesting area of research for anybody who's getting into this kind of stuff yeah, that's that sounds so interesting. And for our listeners, like <clears throat> if you listen to my alchemical bromance, there's lots of cool in-depth discussions on stuff that you know. On our show, we are a little we we're not quite as in-depth. But if you're curious to learn more, definitely check out the Arnamancy blog, the social media pages, and my alchemical bromance. Yeah, and I guess another thing that I wanted to mention is that I use um, I use sort of the same image magic techniques when I uh, read tarot. Oh, interesting, yeah. Um, so I have a tarot reading technique that is uh, sort of like really intricately tied to the Renaissance art of memory, and it uses the same kind of uh, image techniques that the art of memory uses. Well, that sounds fascinating. About yeah, do you have a blog post about that? I've written about it a little bit, but I didn't realize until fairly recently that I was doing something that other people weren't doing. I thought this was how everybody <laughs> memorized and used the tarot. And then when I talked to other people who are either learning it or have been reading, who doing it for a while, I'm like, oh, have I, have I stumbled upon something new? And then I was reading a book by Giordano Bruno that was recently translated, and I realized that what I had done is I had recreated... Um, a memory technique that he had written down like 500 years ago, 400 years ago. What, I don't even know what year it is, but something like that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm still sort of trying to figure out uh, what I've done or how to talk about it, but um, but it has to do with sort of creating these uh, these memory structures like grids and three-dimensional structures in which the the sort of like concepts of the different cards sort of live and work. Um, and it mostly works for, for me anyhow, I mostly use it for the minor arcana in particular, like the, the, the one through tens and then the, the, the court cards sort of have their own ways of working that I 
that I use. And then for the major arcana, it's the Fool's Journey, which like I think every tarot reader mm-hmm. lear- learns how to sort of interpret the Fool's Journey or sort of read the Fool's Journey or talk about it, um, which is a memory palace technique. We just don't necessarily recognize it as such. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, so so yeah. When I when I do it, I can read the tarot like a weird crossword puzzle maybe a scrabble board awesome yeah we're definitely going to need to look into that more and and keep studying um yeah thank you so much for for talking with us today this has been such a fun conversation even though we kind of i feel like we went all over the place but i feel like it's going to be a great episode for our listeners because for the record mercury is square jupiter today so (laughs) So, it makes well, sense. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever uh, been a guest on a podcast where afterwards the podcast host is like, you did a great job staying on topic. <laughs> we don't want to stay on topic. So, yeah, that's what makes podcasts fun. Well, is... I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I like it. Uh, I love the conversational aspect of it. I, I And it's been it's been a real pleasure not only to discover your podcast like so early in its in its life and sort of follow it but to to be a guest so so thank you guys very much for having me on yeah thank you so much yeah thanks a lot eric and again for our listeners check out my alchemical bromance available wherever podcasts are played right yeah and arnabc the website Mm -hmm. awesome all right thanks eric So thanks for listening to our episode today. I really enjoyed our interview with Eric from My Alchemical Bromance. And we'd love to hear from you guys if you guys are enjoying our podcast. I know we're still kind of new onto the scene and it'd really help us out a lot if you gave us a five-star review on iTunes or if you have any guests that you'd like us to interview or any topics you'd be interested in having us discussing definitely go ahead and send us an email. We're at cosmickeyspodcast at gmail.com or you can just DM us on the gram. So we are at cosmic underscore keys underscore podcast. So definitely get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you guys and get some feedback. So thanks again for watching. Thanks guys. See you next week.